Okay, folks, I think we're going to need to, to, to get started. I know other people will be coming in. It's about almost five after three. Um, and I want to make sure we've got time uh, for good, uh, for time, not only for the talks, but also for questions for, for our two outside speakers that we have uh, at the end uh, of, this, of this session. Um, I want to thank everyone who's back in. I know others will be coming in from the other room here as we get started. So right before I, I make the introduction, I want to remind everyone about the RFA uh, that is out right now for uh, uh, machine learning and data analytics across the translational spectrum. I know we've talked about it before. We have the handouts, the letters of intent, not the full uh, grant, but just the letter of intent is due next Friday. Uh, so please uh, uh, take a look at that. And if you're interested, there'll be an internal review. And then only a, a small number will be asked to uh, uh, to um, to do to do the extra work of the of the full grant opportunity. So we're very happy to have the support not only of the CTSA for that, but also the the uh, TCO uh, here on campus as well as the Office of Research. Uh, so we're very very pleased about that. So for those who don't know me, I'm Matt Ringel. I'm the deputy director of the CTSA. Um, I'm also the Division of Endocrinology Director, and I co-lead the Cancer Biology Program of the Cancer Center, um, and um, really pleased to be involved in this role of uh, trying to lead team science, uh, which is really what the whole CTSA does. I don't know why it has that mantra specified out entirely. I guess I can ask the NCATS director, uh, but, um, but really pleased to be able to do that. As we were discussing this year, what were the great topics that we thought we could really try to have an impact on across campus? this came front and center uh, for all the reasons we've heard before and for all the talent that we have on campus across different departments and colleges. So uh, again, I just wanted to thank you all for being here. So our, our three o'clock speaker is Dr. Shamul Chowdhury. Uh, he comes uh, to us uh, today from uh, San Diego. So we went from better weather to a lot worse weather. Um, He's at the he's a clinical laboratory director at the Rady Children's Institute of Genomic Medicine, which is part of or affiliated with uh, the Rady Children's Hospital, which is associated with UCSD, similar to how Nationwide is affiliated with Ohio State. Um, he has been the clinical laboratory director for a number of years there, and his role is involved in managing genomic analysis, uh, interpretation, regulatory oversight of the clinical laboratory, and trying to bridge rapid genomic analysis into clinical practices, something that we struggle with and work with on a nearly daily basis here in the clinics. Uh, prior to that, he was a laboratory director at, um, at Illumina for their clinical services um, and uh, is uh, trained uh, not only uh, uh, basic science geneticist, but as training in clinical molecular genetics as well. So really an important person to try to bridge the, the genomic data to clinical application. So uh, Shamul, thank you very much for coming and I don't wanna take up any more of your time. Thank you, everyone. <clears throat> Can you guys hear me okay? Uh, so thank you very much for this invitation. Uh, way, way too short of a visit uh, for me as I'll be taking off pretty uh, quickly after the talk, but I, I'm hoping it can uh, be a stepping stone, stone for uh, future converse, uh, conversations between uh, our institute and maybe some of the work that you guys are doing here. Uh, so the title of my talk here is Automation of Rapid Whole Genome Sequencing, The Need for Speed. I'm going to spend the first part of the talk kind of talking about our particular application, uh, the progress that we're making there, and then the second half of the talk really talking about some of the hurdles and challenges we're trying to address now. So this concept of rapid whole genome sequencing, um, it's been going on since 2010, actually, uh, with our CEO, Dr. Kingsmore. So we've already had a bunch of years and, and a lot of progress that's been made. We still have major hurdles to, to move forward to really uh, as we think about this trans translational sciences track of uh, widespread adoption of this and becoming the new standard of care, that's kind of our goal uh, with this technology and this platform. So informed consent was obtained for research. I have no uh, financial disclosures. So who are we briefly? Uh, so we're the Rady Children's Institute for Genomic Medicine. We're a research nonprofit institute. Uh, in our mission statement that we came out with in 2014 still rings true, to prevent 
diagnose, treat, and cure childhood diseases through genomic and systems medicine research. So uh, in what started off as a clinical research endeavor is now moved into the clinical laboratory realm uh, as we, our rapid whole genome sequencing test was certified by CLIA and CAP in 2017, and so we've been offering clinical whole genome sequencing for uh, just over two years now. So I don't need to go through the slide again because I, I think Dr. Austin covered this pretty well, and I was glad to see his numbers lined up with what I had on the slide too, so that's, so that's good. But basically our, our focus is this burden of genetic disease and uh, the diagnostic odysseys that patients are going through and highlighting again uh, you know, this gap that we have in terms of being able to treat these disorders. And we feel um, we have a very unique opportunity in our patient population, the intensive care unit, to really implement these therapies uh, very early in life. So, you know, some of these insults that accumulate don't get a chance uh, to occur. And we've seen the impact of this even now uh, in a number of our patients. And so we, we look to a future of, of really uh, being able to impact thousands of lives in the U.S. and, and uh, na nationwide and internationally. Okay, so we really focus our attention uh, at the Rady Children's Institute for Genomic Medicine for patients in the neonative intensive care unit, pediatric intensive care unit, and cardiovascular intensive care unit. Now we do sequence children in other outpatient settings and, and other units uh, that come through. Right now we have a network of 25 different children's hospitals that are sending us uh, you know, samples and medical records, and we're running our rapid whole genome sequencing analysis and pipeline for those hospitals, and we're hoping to continue to expand that network. We're focusing on these 5% uh, of children uh, that constitute 60% of the health care costs, so these are children in the ICU. Um, depending on the institution, a cost of just being in the ICU can be five or six thousand dollars per night. That's not even counting all the different interventions and therapies and surgical procedures that these children unfortunately have to go through. And so why rapid whole genome sequencing and why the ICU? Uh, it's a great synergy and again a great test case in that you're looking at the genetics for a child very early in life. A lot of the environment uh, has not come into play. Uh, you're looking at the whole genome, so doing comprehensive testing is a first-year test, as oftentimes in these kids, they don't have time for a sequential uh, diagnostic odyssey trajectory. Uh, timely and targeted treatment, so even we're seeing conditions now with where our current evidence is and our current medical uh, information available, we are able to identify conditions that are treatable right now for these, for these kids, and, le and we've seen it lead to better patient outcomes. So this is kind of the, the paradigm that we talk about and kind of our vision for what we're calling rapid precision medicine program, our RPM program. So traditional medicine, and this can be in the ICU or this can be just in any patient uh, for a child with an undiagnosed uh, disorder. You have this search for a diagnosis, empirically treating if it's a child with seizures, trying the first, second, third line anti-epileptic drugs. They either get better or they get worse. Uh, you modify the treatment, and you go through this again and again and again, and unfortunately, with the way that we currently test and some of the limitations of, especially kids in the ICU, uh, oftentimes they don't have access to inpatient genetic testing. Oftentimes the directives in hospitals are to wait until the patient's outpatient uh, to get this testing. And so you see a very low diagnostic yield and uh, a very low probability of changing the outcomes of these kids. So now we have seen in our experience about doing about 1,100 or so kids so far uh, using kind of this platform, this technology that continues to develop, uh, running ultra-rapid genome sequencing for, for certain patients, and this is kind of where we're looking at our next evolution of this, of what are the best kids to sequence and what are the right clinical scenarios to do this. Um, now you have a molecular diagnosis that allows you to hone in on the empirical treatment uh, that, that, that may be indicated. A fourth of these kids, uh, a third of these kids get diagnosed. A fourth of these kids uh, have a change in management. And a fifth have a change in outcomes. This is out of the whole cohort. Now, this number of the diagnostic yield, I think, is always very interesting as you compare across studies. So if we really cherry-picked cases and really were very selective of that, this yield could very easily be upwards of 40, 50, 60 percent 
Uh, we're really trying to look at this broader because oftentimes these kids aren't kids that are screaming out that they have a genetic disorder or there's a very broad differential. And so really to, to look at the, the overall impact and making sure we have the biggest impact in this is looking at this broader uh, from some of our projections and based off of some of our randomized control studies that we've run, uh, we could project you know, anywhere between 20 to 40,000 kids in the United States per year that could benefit from this testing. And then another benefit of this is, uh, although we can never you know, uh, conclusively rule out genetic disease, we can really decrease that prior probability by running a comprehensive whole genome sequencing test right off the bat. And so we've seen multiple examples of a negative genome actually altering patient management. Uh, and so that's another benefit that's you know, not as easy to capture and maybe is not as flashy of a story, but there are uh, we have certain indications where people are making determinations in terms of transplants or uh, particular interventions based off of the genome result, positive or negative. And so the evolution of rapid whole genome sequencing, so going uh, way back, uh, I guess, in terms of uh, the first genome for $2.7 billion in 13 years, and to where we were just about last year, and uh, one of our uh, papers that came out in 2019 in terms of being able to provide a provisional diagnosis from a rapid whole genome sequence uh, in 19 hours, and I'll talk a little bit about that. Uh, proof of concept study, and again, our vision for the future of what this potentially could be and where NLP, AI, and some of these other modalities fit into this. And so, as you see, we've been kind of going through our evolution of a decreased cost, uh, decrease in our turnaround time, as we really envision uh, hopefully a day where uh, you know, we're able to do this at scale, and we're able to provide a diagnosis within 24 hours for all the kids that need it, uh, running a rapid whole genome sequencing test. So we've looked at effectiveness. We've looked at multiple clinical scenarios. We're now doing multi-center studies uh, looking at this. And now we kind of look at to the next frontier of what is it going to take for us to get to widespread adoption. And uh, again, I'm going to highlight some of the, the hurdles and current challenges we have for us to get there. So this is kind of the, the summary of the world's literature of rapid genomic sequencing, be it exome or be it genome sequencing, and what the numbers have shown. Now another paper came out this week of rapid exome sequencing from a reference laboratory and out of Boston Children's Hospital. So uh, luckily there are other people working on this, and I think the data holds, uh, holds true and holds strong across various studies. You see the, the sample sizes here, uh, with the largest one being a uh, French paper out of the UK and doing rapid genomic sequencing. Uh, Dr. Stark, a close collaborator of us, uh, doing things uh, in Australia and running their rapid whole exome sequencing protocol. So you see here this diagnostic rate uh, that occurred. The 16% was actually in, uh, it was a combination of neonates in the NICU as well as healthy newborns. Uh, and you see the, the, the ranges that, that uh, can occur here. Uh, one of our landmark papers we just came out with uh, was a randomized control trial where we broadly sequenced kids, randomizing them from, to a genome or an exome out of the ICU and having a diagnostic yield about 20%, which uh, at surface value uh, may seem low, but actually from us, uh, when we looked at the numbers and projected it out, it actually made us think that the prevalence of genetic disease in the ICU is higher than what we thought it uh, actually would be. So again, uh, always interpret those diagnostic yield numbers with caution. And so you can see the utility remains high across the studies. Change in outcome, you see a lot of studies don't assess that. It can be very hard to gather that data and follow these patients in a meaningful time frame to see what the impact could be. Us as a field in genetics actually haven't done a great job of measuring clinical utility and looking at change in management from our testing. So, you know, we actually look at, you know, this number, maybe even more than looking at this number, even though there is obviously a correlation there. And the savings now, we're, we're seeing the data out there that there is cost savings actually uh, with this technology and implementing this, even with the current costs. So this is one of our... Uh, cohort studies that we published in 2018 looking at the savings uh, of providing a rapid whole genome diagnosis. So we modeled six of our cases uh, out of this cohort of 42 patients. And just in modeling those six cases, 
uh, we found a net healthcare savings of $130,000. And so that is taking the savings from having the molecular diagnosis. It was compared to either a control, if we could find a control for a rare ge uh, genetic disease, or what's published in the literature, or we did a counterfactual with an international uh, Delphi panel uh, in the scenario that we uh, presented in terms of having a rapid genome sequence and not having a rapid genome sequence. And so it was $800,000 healthcare savings. It cost us $670,000 to sequence the entire cohort of 42 patients. And so that ended up with a conservative estimate of 130,000. Again, only modeling six cases. We diagnosed other kids in this cohort, but we just didn't have a good control. Uh, so again, in this, in this uh, era that we live in, in terms of rare, uh, rare undiagnosed genetic disease and making these molecular diagnoses, this is a really difficult part. And actually, as we think about our implementation studies, there's the cost of onboarding sites, there's the cost of sequencing the analysis, and then there's that downstream cost of analyzing the data and doing the financial and the economic modeling, and that part is actually uh, very difficult. We, we just uh, are getting close to completing a pilot with the state of California of five children's hospitals uh, of sequencing Medi-Cal babies using rapid genomic sequencing with really promising initial results uh, around 150 kids, but that project was broken into those three phases. And now this phase three, uh, you know, out of this state appropriated fund, about a third of it is this downstream analysis of modeling, the change in management, the change in outcomes. So again, as we think about this, and maybe as you're thinking about some of your projects in terms of implementation into the clinic and the value proposition uh, to your physicians, to your hospital administration, a lot of the effort uh, on our end goes into there, and uh, me as a laboratory geneticist, I never thought I would be doing so much economics, uh, but that, that's kind of where the field is, has taken us now. And so uh, in thinking about the stakeholders for this type of technology and uh, who needs to buy into this, so as part of our randomized control trial, uh, here's a study number here, uh, what did physicians think? Did they think that this was a useful test? Overall, they did think it was quite useful. This is regardless if it was a rapid genome or exome or an ultra-rapid, which is a workflow that we ran for kids that were too sick that we felt to be randomized, some neutrals, a few not useful. I remember one of these specifically. Uh, they did not think it was beneficial because we didn't make a diagnosis. Uh, and then these are now asking the parents, too, is, again, thinking about stakeholders and the implementation of this. Uh, largely, parents were in agreement that this choice, that they believe that it was a good choice to perform rapid whole genome sequencing in their child. And uh, this issue came up a few different times, even in the lunch session with Aon Genomics, in terms of uh, our intensive care unit setting and informed consent. So in that uh, particular environment, uh, parents going through basically the most stressful situation they can imagine in their lives potentially a situation of their child um, having severe long-term uh, effects of a, of a disease, uh, even uh, in our cohort of 42 patients or N of 42, uh, nine of those patients ended up passing away. So uh, really in uh, the most critical of clinical settings, uh, what is the most effective way to obtain informed consent, uh, especially from genome sequencing and the findings that potentially we could report out on. So we really try to focus on the phenotypic driven analysis, trying to answer why the baby is sick, but we do come across incidental findings, things of that nature, findings not related to the patient's phenotype. And so we will uh, report out those if the parents opt into that type of finding. So I do wanna bring up just one case example, and then I'll move towards kind of the future looking steps here. Uh, so I just want to highlight this example of hopefully putting a, a picture uh, and putting the clinical picture of this and maybe you can picture uh, another child or another clinical scenario for this and what we hope this test can do in helping our physicians and helping these families downstream. So this was a baby from our randomized control trial, an eight-day-old admitted to the ER in status epilepticus, so uh, uncontrolled seizures. Uh, had fetal ventricular megaly, 
Uh, the delivery is uncomplicated, actually was feeding well, uh, went home at day three of life, uh, but then the child presented with seizures. The parents brought the child to Rady Children's Hospital and the emergency department, uh, had birth suppression uh, on, the, uh, on the brain scan. Uh, you could see mild hypoplasia of the cerebellum. Uh, they were doing all of the, the workups that you typically do with a child uh, in the status ep epilepticus. Uh, they looked at the CSF, looking at creatine kinase, and uh, so there was uh, some indication that there might be a metabolic process that was being affected based off of some of these values. And so through that night, uh, they were trying some of the first line and second line anti-epileptic drugs. Uh, those didn't seem to be working on, on managing the seizures. They were getting worse. Uh, as you can see, they were trying the first and second and third lines. Our, uh, we have a neurologist, inpatient neurologist, that focuses in the ICU that sees a lot of these kids that, that we see at Rady Children's Hospital. And uh, you know, he, this was the note from him in terms of, I dis discussed with his parents the range of outcomes I've seen with neonatal birth suppression and cephalopathy, which usually entails limited life expectancy and at least a moderate to severe developmental disability. Now, we ran a rapid whole genome sequence on this child. Uh, the parents consented into the study, and it's very uh, interesting now getting to know this family afterwards, and we ask them, you know, months after this occurred, uh, what do you remember from the informed consent? And basically, the answer was nothing. Just that there was a test available that could potentially help my child sign me up, I I'm all in. And so, uh, in this scenario, we found two variants in a gene ALDH7A1, uh, which is a pyroxidine-dependent epilepsy. They had actually started the B6 uh, regimen just prior to having this molecular diagnosis. But with having this molecular diagnosis, uh, it's known that sometimes the kids don't respond right away. You have to keep administering it. Having this molecular diagnosis in hand gave the neurologist and the metabolic team the confidence to continue forward with this regimen uh, and focus on, on the B6-dependent epilepsy molecular diagnosis. And so this is kind of one of those uh, pathway slides that the metabolic geneticists love. And, and basically, what it, this is the part of the pathway where ALDH7A1 uh, is blocked, and you're getting an accumulation of some of these metabolites. So there's kind of a, a three-combination approach to manage, uh, manage these children, of so supplementing them with B6 and arginine and restricting their lysine. And so uh, in this scenario, we're able to give, make a diagnosis, provide that information 55 hours after consent of the, uh, of the patient and the family. Uh, the seizure stopped. Within 36 hours, the child was extubated, and they're able to stop anti-epileptic drugs. And now at 22 months of age, he's hitting his milestones. We, we get to see him. His uh, name is Maverick, his patients. Uh, his parents have consented to us. Uh, posting pictures and uh, presenting the story as they are really one of our uh, greatest advocates for this type of testing and the impact it can have. So we actually uh, just had a uh, get together at the Padres baseball game and Maverick was there uh, with his sister and it's just amazing to uh, see this uh, healthy, uh, chunky boy uh, moving around and, and having hopefully what will be uh, you know, a mostly normal life. And so this is uh, the paradigm, again, I present it and compare it to the standard of care uh, in the similar clinical scenario, and these are two, again, real uh, patients. So this was a patient that also presented uh, with birth suppression, suspected Odahara syndrome, for a child at Rady Children's Hospital before the institute was founded and before we were testing patients. So this child uh, went through the search for a diagnosis went 42 days before making a molecular diagnosis. A panel test did eventually make a diagnosis of KCNQ2, epileptic encephalopathy, but at that point, uh, this child had profound neurological damage and was hospitalized in the ICU for 60 days. We were able to perform on a, a child uh, about two years ago, so we'd gotten our, our testing started. We performed ultra-rapid genome sequencing made the same diagnosis in KCNQ2, but now in this time we made it within the first week of life, uh, and they were able to give a very specific treatment regimen based off of KCNQ2. Uh, they're resistant for a bunch of the first-line anti-epileptic drugs, and so for this child, 
It was a 17-day hosp hospitalization. Uh, she was able to make it home for Christmas. Uh, and now at just about two and a half years, she has minor developmental delays and she's walking uh, and you know, she's progressing pretty nicely. So you see the different in outcomes and just putting that emphasis on providing a molecular diagnosis in a time frame conducive to really make a difference and really make an impact on patient outcomes. Okay, so uh, hopefully I've presented the argument or the case that this is a good thing. This is something that we should be doing broadly uh, for children uh, across the United States. And uh, you know, this is something hospitals should either try to, to bring up in their laboratories or partner with other institutions that are doing it. Um, you know, the current barriers are, uh, is the expense justified? Uh, you know, I'm biased, but my, you know, opinion is that it's absolutely justified. Right now, our, our kind of one of our next stakeholders working to convince are the insurance companies and reimbursement. Uh, and so we've made, we've made inroads there. We're hoping this state of California pilot will spur others to, to do the same thing. But right now, we're really uh, still in this place where finding the funds to perform the testing, even in a cost recovery model, is something that we're struggling with and trying to figure out uh, what the next step is. <coughs> Sorry about that. Uh, so the genomic analysis time. So as we think about our laboratory and being able to hopefully perform this testing on thousands of kids per year, uh, it still takes us too long to analyze genomes and we can't hire that many people uh, to be able to, to do thousands of genomes per year in a time frame of being able to get a diagnosis within three days. And so this is really where the artificial intelligence and the tools and the development will hopefully help guide us. Uh, you know, me being a laboratory director, I'll, uh, you know, never take my, uh, my hands off this process completely, but hopefully can be more of a uh, shepherding the process as opposed to a, a deep manual uh, intervention on every single case that comes through. I won't talk about some of the limitations from the genomic side of things here. I did highlight on the responsible consent and return of results. The education and outreach is a big part that we're emphasizing at the Institute. We've been doing a lot of webinars and a lot of sessions on Genomics 101. And then this is another part that I think uh, highlights a little bit in terms of really seeing the benefit of this testing. We've unfortunately had scenarios where we've delivered a molecular diagnosis and the appropriate intervention wasn't done uh, in time. And so what, what is the reason for that? Part of it is the education, uh, physicians not being familiar with that particular condition, maybe not having the access to clinical genetics that they need. So we really look to a future of not just training uh, a new set of the workforce, but being able to deliver molecular information with potentially the right resources and treatment guidance to, to help physicians that may not be as savvy in genomics to be able to perform this testing, because we know that there's not enough clinical geneticists and not enough genetic counselors uh, in the country to be able to do this testing for every child that needs it. So uh, this is another area that we hope that uh, some of the automation and some of the, the artificial intelligence may help us in being able to automate delivery of this type of information. So this is kind of the, the rapid whole genome sequencing conundrum. So the sequencing part, uh, it's making amazing progress uh, thanks to companies like Illumina, which is just down the road from us in San Diego. Now they have an instrument called the NovaSeq with, uh, with a flow cell that can process a, a human whole genome in less than 17 hours, so that's, that's great. And they have alignment and variant calling. Uh, so there was a uh, there's a company called Etico uh, that, that created this dragon for processing for alignment and variant calling. They were their own separate company in San Diego. Illumina just bought them. And so now Illumina kind of has both of these keys uh, in, this, in this process. And so now we can process a whole genome aligning and variant calling it in 45 minutes. So this is, this is great. Now the interpretation and reporting, uh, this part still can take hours, if not days. Um, we know in the outpatient settings there's still exome offerings that are coming back in three to six months, if not longer than that. And I think as a field, uh, again, I think it's very important for us 
to, uh, and uh, Dr. Austin hit on this a little bit, uh, if you continue to do things the same way, things are just going to stay the same. Uh, and the way that we're interpreting and analyzing genomes, we've been working hard on this standardization. This meant to show the ACMG metric for uh, interpretation and reporting of genetic variants. And I think this is all the right stuff we need to be capturing. But again, in terms of how long it's taking us to analyze a genome or an exome or a panel, I think that we need to challenge ourselves as a field to look at it differently. And uh, me as a laboratory director, we're not really known as great innovators, probably the opposite of that. But uh, as I've seen it in this clinical scenario and the benefit of delivering a result faster, even just a day faster, even a couple hours faster, can really make an impact uh, on a patient's life potentially. So I think this, this part of the process we really need to we really need to lean on, and we really need to challenge ourselves of why are we doing things the way we're doing it? How can technology help augment this process? And you know, some of these reference laboratories are hiring staffs of hundreds and hundreds of people to pour over the literature and curate variants. And again, they have to do that because that's the way that we're doing things now. But uh, a research institute like us will never be able to to, to do something like that. That model does not make sense for us. So we have to, we have to think of this question differently, and that's what I kind of want to highlight in this talk as we're, as we're moving forward here. So this is kind of our, our process now. Things that come off the sequencer, their alignment and variant calling has happened, and now there's kind of all these steps in here that we're working towards having the data in our analyst's hands and getting a communication to the physician about a potential molecular diagnosis. So we're kind of tracking the case. If it's a critical case, we're uh, you know, checking to see when the data will be available, when the case is available, uh, the phenotyping process. So right now, we're doing a combination of a manual curation of sometimes they send us a PDF with a bunch of medical notes. If it's a RADI case, we'll pour into the EMR, try and pull out key phenotypic terms. I'll talk about why we want to get rid of that process here in a second. All right, so now let's create our case for analysis. Let's go through, let's run our filters. Uh, let's select variants that we want to dig in deeper. Okay, now we need to curate those variants by the ACMG criteria and classification scheme. We need to order confirmation uh, to orthogonally confirm the variants. We need to review our report. We need to deliver that report to the physician taking care of the child and verbally communicate that as well. And typically, what we're trying to do for cases that are, uh, we call them ultra-rapid, uh, when data is available for the analysts in the morning, we're trying to get that result out in the same day. So we're trying to basically do all these handoff and all these processes in one day, um, and they're very manual, and we know that, again, this doesn't scale uh, to a certain level if you're thinking about this in the impact of thousands. So really our focus is, how do we use technology to augment this process? And then running whole genomes, uh, it's, you know, it's a blessing and a curse. Uh, we're clinically validated to look at a lot of different things in the genome. And this isn't even counting thinking in the future of having long read technology, uh, other pieces of information available in the genome. And so now we're adding more things to interpret while trying to decrease the time to analyze. So uh, again, thinking about the automation and the, the filtering scheme. So this is currently what we do from uh, PCR-free short read whole genome sequences. And uh, you know, this is what we're looking forward to potentially do in the future. OK, so uh, I talked a little bit about this in the being a laboratory director in this rapid genomic sequencing era. And I uh, like to think that I'm being a bridge between uh, all this data that's coming through and being this bridge to our physicians. I spent a lot of time on the phone with physicians talking about results, trying to get them to understand uh, the impact of it. But at the same time, uh, I'm very cautious of this too, of uh, trying to uh, ensure that we're doing this in a responsible way. And as we think about automation, that we have done all of the testing, and we've done that same scientific rigor that, again, Dr. Austin kind of referred to, taking that scientific clinical validation approach to some of these uh, automation and algorithms to help us in analyzing the genome. So 
you know, I, hopefully I'm some combination of this, uh, you shall not pass, but uh, the bridge will be open when we're ready for it to be open. Okay, so I, I want to talk a little bit through this slide in terms of our 19-hour whole genome sequencing uh, and what we view as potentially the future of being able to analyze a genome. So uh, in this process, what we did is we had, uh, these were patients at Rady Children's Hospital, um, and they were, a test was ordered in EPIC that triggered uh, us running natural language processing on that patient's chart with the collaboration we had with Alexion and ClinyThink for an NLP algorithm uh, that worked directly with our EMR. And we took the months and months to go through the paperwork, go through the Children's Hospital IT, uh, get everything approved, get it through the IRB. And so now we have uh, the NLP running uh, on, this, uh, on this patient for a test being ordered <coughs> for rapid whole genome sequence. This is our ordering accessioning portal that's kind of specific to our workflow. And so then the sequencing uh, is being performed here kind of in parallel. So you see this, we are starting from a dried blood spot, running uh, a version of a library prep with Illumina that allows you to go from blood spot to uh, library to go on the sequencer in just two and a half hours. Um, and so then we ran it on the S1 flow cell, running it to our clinical standard of a 40x average genome coverage. So the sequencing is running. Uh, it's running through the Dragon pipeline. At the same time, the HPO terms are being generated for a particular case. Now using the NLP, this can be anywhere from 30 to 400 HPO terms depending on how long the patient's been in the hospital and how many visits they've had. And then what happens in this pipeline is uh, the HPO terms get uploaded into the analysis software, the genomic data becomes available, and the variants are then prioritized and a short list of variants is generated for us to make a provisional uh, and preliminary diagnosis. And what we saw in a retrospective analysis of running this pipeline, uh, comparing it to uh, human manual process that had 97% recall, 99% precision, and 95 children with 97 genetic disease. Uh, diseases, not, not too shabby, right? Um, and so this process is kind of our proof of concept of what we would like things to look like in the future. A lot of these processes right now are manual, the HPO, all of these things in the laboratory process are not clinically validated yet. Um, this automated process and how many things we analyze in a genome, we still find things that the prioritization doesn't catch. There's still uh, things that fall through the cracks as we look at our larger cohort. So how do we develop the system to make sure that we could be confident that, you know, now for a case, instead of reviewing you know, on the magnitude of 100 to 150 variants, can we get to a place of reviewing 10 to 15 variants and feeling confident that if there's not an answer there, the genome with our current understanding of the clinical medical genome uh, is a negative case, and that's kind of uh, the place that we're looking forward to here in the future. And so this was, uh, I guess, the, uh, the Guinness Book of World Records for fastest genetic diagnosis and our laboratory staff hated this process of like having the people timing you and all that stuff. So, uh, and so we published this work uh, in April of this year uh, of this process that I described. So I just wanted to uh, show you that. So this was in Science and Translational Medicine research article for, for everyone to reference. And uh, as we think about clinical and translational sciences in a team science approach, I guess this is the author list we look at now. Uh, as we think about the team sciences, right? There was industry, there was academia, there was clinicians, there was laboratory directors, there was genetic counselors, and they were all involved in this process. And I guess this is what we're working towards, right? I think this is what, what the future will be. And so again, this combination is really what we're focusing on. You know, we're, we're doing a really nice job in terms of sequencing the genome. <clears throat> we know there's gaps and there's, um, things that we're missing, and we need, to, we need to fix those. But kind of our next ohm, our omics that we're focusing on is the phenome. 
<clears throat> and being able to utilize that information as best as we can. And then the next omics in our roadmap, we don't know yet, I think. I think we're waiting to see um, what the field tells us about that. <clears throat> and so this is kind of a snapshot of that NLP that happens in our interface with ClinyThink. So this is now, uh, this is kind of what I need sometimes instead of just seeing a list of, you know, hundreds of terms, kind of need to see it within the context of the note. Uh, and so in this scenario, here's the list. It highlights kind of where it is within the chart. So sometimes, uh, you know, sometimes we go back into the chart to make that as opposed to uh, the old paradigm of the clinical information driving you to the part of the genome to investigate. Sometimes the genome drives you back to look at the clinical information and make that correlation. And we find that oftentimes now of the variant is screaming at us. The clinical picture uh, doesn't quite fit, but once we look back and look a little deeper, uh, that we are able to make, make that link. Okay, and so why uh, collect a deep phenotype? Uh, the clinical features, especially in intensive care unit, they don't match up a lot with the, the, the textbooks and what I read when I was doing my clinical genetics training, which wasn't that long ago. Uh, and so what we often are seeing, we're seeing pre atypical presentations of classic genetic syndromes, but these kids have never been sequenced before this early in life. And so, uh, you know, a, a child with Kabuki syndrome, a neonatal Kabuki syndrome, uh, looks a lot different than a child that's five years old with Kabuki syndrome and with the diagnosis. And so this, having this uh, automated workflow and this deep phenotype really helps us in making that link and establishing the diagnosis. And so what you see here, this was the mean phenotypes from the automated process. Our mean phenotypes of the MDs doing it was five. This is overlap. It's a lot, <coughs> excuse me, sorry, it's a lot deeper of a phenotype uh, available uh, as part of using this workflow. Okay, so now this gets a little bit into the filtering and the genetics for just a representative case. So here's your nucleotide sequenced, three billion uh, base pairs. You know, we're getting about 90 to 90 for 95 percent of the genome aligned. Um, about five million variants, depending on the case and the ethnicity, looking at rare variants. And now honing in, using that deep phenotypic information, using that HPO link, now we're really honing in on uh, a, a particular set of variants uh, and a particular set of genes. And then in our workflow, be it manual or automated, uh, in about 70% of our cases, the molecular diagnosis is in the first five to 10 variants in our list out of the five million. So this isn't, it wasn't that long ago that I was spending about 40 man hours analyzing uh, a genome and trying to find it. it could be anywhere on that list uh, at that point. So again, the progress we're making is amazing. I'm highlighting some of the challenges, but again, I guess that's kind of what our, our human nature is in some of these things. Okay, so then that same process I show you showed here, I, I see <coughs> a lot of potential for us to be able to move forward. I'm gonna take a quick drink here. Dramatic pause. Uh, so basically, I, I'm looking at a process and we're already working on some of this stuff of where NLP AI, I talked about the, the phenotyping. When I think about um, automation on this too, it's, and it's not quite NLP or AI, but it's, removing human intervention for different parts of the process too, right, where we don't need it. Um, confirmation ordering, uh, we're working on some automation there too. I'm really trying to challenge people too as well. The technology has progressed so much, do we really need to be doing orthogonal confirmation of all of these findings as well? We're working on a rubric, and there's been a lot of labs showing this as well. So again, trying to take current thinking and previous thinking and and, and challenge those and have us move forward. And I talked about this a little bit and touched on it. We do a lot of verbal communication of results, again, calling the intensive care unit doctor that's uh, on call uh, and may have never heard of this genetic disease before. So what information can we provide to them in that scenario that can actually help them manage their patient while still keeping kind of that arm's length of we're laboratory, we're not meant to be influencing their practice of medicine. 
but hopefully providing them information for those cases where you do have uh, very specific guidelines, making sure that they have that information available. And so this is our current uh, network of partners. I talked about Project Baby Bear uh, a little bit. We're also doing an, an NIH uh, uh, study called the Gemini Study with six children's hospitals that are getting a rapid whole genome sequence, at the same time getting a rapid panel of about 1,700 genes and comparing the outcomes and the utility of those two approaches. Uh, and then some of our other RWGS partners and some of our alliance partners uh, global Genes, uh, as well as the Vermont Oxford Network, which is a quality assurance uh, network of about 1,200 NICUs. And so my last couple slides here, uh, I just wanted to highlight, let me see how I'm doing on time. Uh, I just wanted to highlight a couple things. So this is kind of coming back to how we currently do things and looking at day of admission, day of discharge, and when we get a uh, diagnosis and what the impact can be. Standard genetic testing you see here on the curve. Rapid genomic sequencing, you're diagnosing a much higher proportion and getting those results before day of discharge. This is kind of just picking seven days as kind of a, a benchmark for that. Then when we perform genome sequencing, not in under seven days, but in under three days, we see this impact of the proportion that get diagnosed is higher and we see uh, returning this result in 100% of these kids before they're discharged to really impact their inpatient management. So we actually look at a future that, you know, 7 to 10 to 14 days in the ICU may not be good enough. We really need this to be 3 to 5 days, 2 days. <coughs> if you ask our CEO, Dr. Kingsmore, one day for all the kids uh, that are eligible in the intensive care unit. And so this is kind of our, our look to the future as we think about rapid precision medicine and implementation science and kind of our, our look at this. So I, I kind of highlighted this uh, rapid whole genome sequencing part, but we're also looking at basically a system of medicine, not just a test that we're offering. We're looking at engaging our stakeholders. We're talking about, uh, again, the payers, the parents, the physicians, and this precision medicine delivery and follow-up, so getting this information to the ICU and the information that they need and trying to work towards uh, building a, a knowledge base of 10,000 NICU, PICU, and CVICU genomes in the next couple years uh, and really working with pharmaceutical companies uh, to look at uh, therapeutic inter interventions and innovation uh, that can be done looking at, again, having molecular diagnoses in kids earlier than we've ever had before and what the impacts of some of these therapies can be. So uh, looking at this future of now, you know, kids that are being able to be treated with spinal muscular atrophy and some of these more pathway approaches, I think it's a very uh, exciting time. and. It, there's always such a benefit to providing a molecular diagnosis, but now also to be able to potentially uh, layer therapies onto some of these conditions that we never were able to tackle before uh, is, is really inspiring. And so <coughs> we look at this circle here of feeding back the information of what are the patients we should be sequencing, learning from each uh, child that comes in the door and providing this information to the community. And so uh, it takes a village, and this is our team at RCIGM and some of our collaborators and, and partners. And uh, with that, I thank you for your time, and I'm happy to take a few questions. Yeah, that was a terrific talk, and really congratulations. Just really impressive and, and great cases that you shared. I was thinking um, a, a little bit maybe about your thoughts about implementing. We do a lot of this with somatic uh, mutations, particularly in tumor, in tumor settings, or also some of your more, quote, dark matter type patients where you're not picking up a DNA genetic abnormality, as you point out, pathway targeted therapies and things. Whether you've begun to look at uh, you know, methylomics or, um, or RNA sequencing or any of those sorts of things to get a sense of, of maybe targetable directions to go. And 
and how that might influence some of uh, what you're doing with the, um, with the informatics going forward. Yeah, so uh, I think, again, our roadmap for some of those other omics are still a little unclear to us. Um, we have been doing some targeted RNA-seq on some patients, but usually those have been driven by something in the genome that's, um, that we wanted to investigate further. Uh, but there's been some really nice papers that have come out recently looking at the utility <coughs> of this in undiagnosed disease patients. So I, 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 could, I see that frontier coming. Uh, I, for us, I don't know. For us, it's thinking about uh, in providing that information in a, in a timely manner for our patients, because we've actually been thinking about you know, banking samples and some of these kids to do some of these studies in the future. But one of our rate limiting steps is <clears throat> actually the sample. Uh, and a lot of these times we only get like 0.5 mil of blood uh, in these kiddos. But, uh, but I'm, I'm, I'm really hoping that our next thing that we do tackle is either RNA-seq or potentially something in the methylome. Yes, please. Uh, Stephen Kaler, Nationwide Children's. Uh, wonderful talk. Thank Thanks for all this pioneering work. I was a bit surprised, however, at the, the cost. In one of your early slides, you mentioned $8,500 mm -hmm. per, per patient. So that was one question. Isn't yeah. it, isn't it, couldn't it be done at a lower cost? I know it's exponentially declining. Uh, the other question had to do with, yes, it's great to be focusing on the acutely ill neonates, but there are many genetic illnesses, of course, that are, don't present with acute illness, uh, for which uh, some of which are medically actionable. And so what about newborn screening uh, in general, molecular approaches to newborn screening uh, using uh, genome sequencing technology? Thank you, two, two great questions. So in terms of the cost, um, when you do things rapidly, the costs go up significantly. Yeah. So uh, in our case of a ultra rapid child, We'll, sometime, we'll get them on the sequencer as fast as possible where uh, a lab that can wait to batch can run maybe at a reagent cost of $1,000, where for us it'll be more like $3,000 to run that child then. Uh, and then in terms of the staffing and the cost uh, to do it at that turnaround time, uh, basically us and our collaborators in Australia have basically shown uh, to run a standard genome versus a rapid genome the cost is about 2.5 to 3x more uh, using that model. So, uh, so again, we know that the price point is going to come down and we need to keep working that. Uh, but we do spend a, a lot in terms of the reagents and then the downstream uh, staff and the analysis right now. A lot of the cost comes into, into that piece of it. Now, the newborn screening is a very interesting question. I'm actually just became part of the NBSTRN 2030. Uh, initiative to, to start thinking about this a little bit more. Uh, my, my newborn screening colleagues in California, uh, so we were part of an Insight consortium uh, where our collaborators at UCSF uh, looked at doing a molecularly based newborn screening uh, and doing a pilot study that was funded through the NIH through, through two funding cycles. Um, and basically the, the conclusion from that was that it wasn't ready for prime time. Um, now, if you ask my medical director uh, at RCIGM, David Dimmick, he feels that we're missing a lot of treatable disorders that potentially could be picked up molecularly through newborn screening, but they're not quite fitting our traditional paradigm from the Wilson and Junger principles back in the, in the 50s. So I, I do feel like that we need, to, we need to be running some more pilot studies I know the state of New York is just running a crab-based study uh, looking at molecular, uh, molecular testing in a newborn screening setting as well. Mm -hmm. Are there distinctions between the technique that you employ, whether you're using whole genome sequencing, what about targeted next-gen sequencing or whole exome sequencing? Yes. And what about dried blood spots? Are they suitable for? They are actually with yeah. some of the newer kits that are available surprisingly well. Uh, so I, I think generating a, a clinical grade whole genome from dry blood spots is, is very feasible. We're, we're working on some pilots in that regard. Now, a targeted or exome approach is it's a cheaper approach to this. Uh, I, and I do think that they're in that setting, in terms of a newborn screening setting, if we're talking about needing to do hundreds of thousands, potentially millions of kids per year, potentially that might be the approach. There'll always be some drawback in some things that you may miss that a whole genome won't miss, but potentially that's okay 
in that particular scenario. So I could see, I could see that if you're thinking about a nationwide system, uh, potentially a, an exome or a panel approach being maybe more, more prudent in that setting. Thank you. Uh, neonates are, are precious and important. What about the adult population? Say, <laughs> could you repeat the question again? You know, what about the adult population, you know? Yeah, and I, I want to touch that a little, uh, getting back to part of the question I didn't get as well. I, I could see just the, the platform of doing a rapid whole genome sequence, I think, can plug into multiple clinical scenarios. Oh, did I just turn that off? Into multiple clinical scenarios. Uh, we've done a pilot study with one of our collaborators of uh, Adult myocardial, adult myocardial infarction cohort of doing 50 prospective rapid whole genome sequences. And even though the diagnostic yield was low, there was high clinical utility for those findings that we did find. And so I think this approach of a rapid whole genome sequence, that's kind of one, one uh, population that we've tested. And I, we do do uh, some of this outpatient setting too. Uh, we have a neurogenomics protocol where we've been uh, sequencing kids and older kids as well uh, as part of that study. And we've seen, again, a lot of benefits from that. So uh, again, our, our focus has kind of been this ICU because we are relatively small and focused, but uh, I do see this application, kind of this platform of a rapid whole genome sequence with the appropriate guidance and delivery plugging into other clinical scenarios as well. All right, thank you everyone.